Oh, what's it say? Hmm. He's only young. What was exciting? We were only babies and... Married two years, 18-month-old son, our first home. And we wanted to do it ourselves. It came in a kit form, but part of it was that you had to pay for someone to paint it or you could paint it yourself. And The only thing we could do to save some money was to paint it. And we had to sand the walls first. And 24 years later... Adam was leading a very fast life. He was training to go to the World Championships for his martial arts that he was doing. Yeah, probably the fittest he'd ever been and probably just starting to get his life together, going in the right direction. And he'd rung me and said, I'm just not feeling very well. I'll keep having this flu and it won't go away. He'd been to a doctor and the doctor said he was just training too hard to slow up. And then he was at work one day and he leant forward and he got a pain up under his rib cage. So he went to a different doctor who took x-rays. And he went straight to have, a, have the x-ray and uh, found fluid on his lungs. She sent him to the emergency and they drained the fluid off his lungs and said, go home, you're, you're OK now. Two days later, he was feeling a bit sicker. We took him straight to his doctor who did an X-ray and the fluid was back straight to the emergency. And I think it was six or seven weeks before he was out then. They just did test after test after test. They had no idea. They found some, what they said was meso mesothelial cells, but that they took one look at him and said, he's too young. They can't be right. This is just impossible, so that's why they just kept testing and testing. After being in hospital for five weeks... All he wanted to do was go home and have a shower in his own shower. So he went home. He went in for a shower and, and then his phone rang. And I picked it up and it was the specialist that used to be with him in the hospital and she said, I'm just ringing to let you know that I've got the test results back and... I need to tell you that Adam has got malignant mesothelioma and he's going to be in great pain. I said, so, but he's going to be okay. We just need to learn how to manage his pain. And she said, no, he'll be dead in six months. And I remember closing his phone and thinking, well, I'm pleased I took that phone call, but how do I tell my son he's going to die? So. We broke, broke that to him and he said, oh, well. It's all good. They don't know me. It's all good. I had no idea what mesothelioma was. No idea. That mesothelioma that he got is an asbestos disease. Well, we were told there was nowhere else to get it from. The diseases that people could potentially get from exposure to asbestos, the, there are three main diseases. There's asbestosis, which is a, a dusting or a scarring of the lungs, bronchogenic carcinoma, that's doctor speak for the ordinary sort of lung cancer, and also mesothelioma, which is a, a nasty tumour which arises on the membrane that surrounds the outside of the lungs and the inside of the ribs. So far as asbestos is concerned, people need to appreciate that the disease results from exposure to very, very fine particles, and they're usually produced when people are cutting it with a saw or an angle grinder or something like that. When it's just sitting there, it's a potential risk, but that potential is usually not realised unless someone starts damaging it or breaking it or cutting it. We were racking our brains trying to work out why or where. The only thing that I could remember was being covered in dust when we were painting our first home. It was just sitting in the air um, where we were working. Adam was with us on certain days and he'd had this little pink dustpan and brush, and he used to have a great time, he was always busy. They traced it back that our home was one of the last ones that was produced using the asbestos sheeting. Because it's the outer faces, what you paint and all that sort of stuff, all the warnings are on the inside. I always felt that once we found out where it came from, that our job as parents is to protect our children, and we didn't do that.
when people find that they're diagnosed with an asbestos-related disease, they feel very confused, very isolated, very frightened, and they really don't know where to turn. And this is where the society comes into its own. The support and the services that the society offers are medical, dietitian, nutritional, legal advice, occupational therapy services, phone support, support groups. People may need financial assistance. They were sensational. The Asbestos Society gave us so much information and so much help. There is no cure for any of the asbestos-related diseases. There's only management. So when you're living with that, knowing that there is no cure, you try to make the very best of every day that you have because you really don't know how many that you're going to have. He would only have minute moments of panic and you know, like Christmas was a really hard time for him. We were all positive because of him. So he was boosting us all up and then all of a sudden he's a mess out on the stairs and we're like, hang on a minute, like Christmas is great. We're ha having fun at Christmas. but. He knew it was his last Christmas, so he just had this wave of you know, sadness. I think he just was kind of taking it all in as if that would be the last time he would celebrate Christmas with his family. Merry Christmas! Merry Christmas! Yeah. 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 We're not sending that. <laughs> he loved his family, and when he was sick, all he wanted was all of us around. He didn't want to do anything else. Let's just us. We're good. We had lots of conversations, Adam and I, that he couldn't have with mum and dad. So I was a little bit more aware of where he was at in terms of thinking whether he was going to fight it or not. And I'd say, you know, what do you wish you could do right now? Like, if you could change right now, what do you wish you could do? And he said, I don't want to have to, you know, struggle to breathe to get out of bed and struggle to walk down the hallway and not be able to get down the stairs. I just want to be able to go and be there. And so we were able to have those conversations towards the end. That was two nights before he died. He went to bed the night of the 28th of April. But then he woke us all up having trouble breathing at about three o'clock on the 29th of April. When we got him to the hospital yet again, his eyes were really milky and uh, just nothing, there was nothing. They uh, tried to put a tube down his throat to get more oxygen into his lungs, but he, he obviously decided that it was his time to go. And I said to the nurse, you know, is this, is this it? And he said, yep. All I could say was, Just keep breathing, you can breathe. Adam closed his eyes and I thought, oh, okay, so that's it. And then he opened his eyes, sorry, and they were crystal clear, beautiful blue. And he looked at Don and he looked at me and he smiled at both of us and then he just closed his eyes again. And I just think how much energy and courage that would have taken to do that, to let us know that he was okay and that he wasn't in any pain and that it was okay for him to go. And we had to tell, to tell everyone. And now we're still telling everyone, don't let it happen. Please, sir. The guilt just eats away at them. I think they deal with it better now. Don was devastated. He used to feel very responsible. I know at the time I thought I was saving 
our family some money. People have said to me, what were you thinking? Well, we didn't know. I was thinking that I was doing the best by my family at the time. I wish we had been more aware. You know, 30, 40 years ago, um, asbestos materials were, were commonly used in, in new building materials. There was definitely a lack of awareness. It was not just the Sagers. Most of the community just weren't aware building materials in their house um, contained asbestos. Even today, people do not know what asbestos is or where asbestos can be located. And that is a very frightening thought. Even now, I, unfortunately, I see examples where particularly tradesmen, either through naivety or perhaps because they're not being careful enough, just go in and start cutting it or drilling it without giving it the thought it needs. I think the problem is that people don't see that there's an immediate hazard and so just proceed hoping it'll be OK. People often think of it as an old person's disease. There's often a very long lag time between exposure and development of disease. So while the disease might be affecting older people, it's the exposure when you're young that may be responsible for that disease. So that young people can't afford to ignore it. Our big concern now is the home renovators, the DIY, because they don't necessarily know where there may actually be asbestos in the, their home. There was approximately 3,000 different products that contained asbestos. We should actually make the assumption that asbestos materials are present in houses or buildings, particularly built before 1990. Asbestos awareness saves lives. Yeah, I mean, awareness is the, is the whole solution. If we're aware of it and think of it, we can take appropriate steps to either avoid it or to work with it safely. So find out what's in the house. Just take a moment to gather all the information. There's no excuse for being ignorant now. There's so much information out about it. We recommend that anyone contemplating doing some work on a, on a building that was built before 1990, that they should have the material tested. It's a relatively simple test. Find out what's there, learn how to remove it properly, and make sure the people that you get in to do the work, they are professional, qualified, licensed people. So the clear message is, you don't know what your future exposure will be. So every time you're working with asbestos containing materials, use the controls that prevent fibres from becoming airborne and breathed in. It's not only your own health that you're putting at risk, you can potentially put at risk the health of um, people who are, who are nearby. And that's kind of what you need to remember when you tamper with it is, who am I impacting? Just do what you need to do to keep your family safe. That's our aim in life, I think, isn't it? Keep the ones you love safe. Mm. We're, we're still picking up the pieces. There is that thing in the back of your mind saying, if I hadn't have done it, we would still be having these great Christmases. We would probably be a lot better off, a lot better off. People used to say to me, it's OK, everything happens for a reason. I haven't quite worked out the reason why I'll never hear the sound of my son's voice again. How do you? Reconcile the fact that you'll never hear their voice. That you'll never feel them hug you. He'll never know his nephew. He reminds me of Adam. Definitely see shades of Adam, yeah. Cheeky little monkey. And just him being here just makes me feel like Adam's closer. Like we have a photo on our fridge and we say goodnight to him every night and tell him that we miss him and we wish he was here. So it's kind of bittersweet because it's nice that he's around and brings a lot of joy into our family, but it's also incredibly sad that it's not Adam's and he's not having any kids and he'll never meet Fletcher. My brother's always been into Asian-inspired things and he loved the Japanese gardens at Mount Kutha Botanical Gardens and would always go there um, even before he was sick. And then particularly after he was unwell, he used to find a lot of solitude there. They've allowed us to put a bench seat 
out the front of the Japanese area under a big clump of bamboo and it's a beautiful spot. I love sitting on benches and knowing that a guy's made it and dedicated it to his wife. Yeah, I think that's nice and I hope that people feel the same way when they get to sit with Adam. <laughs> yeah. I hate looking at his name. <laughs> Just to see those dates in print, terrible.